nobody until they're that big has any chance of being able to remember the bloody Latin names. And I, I thought, what the hell? Why do we need Latin names? And when I... Okay. <coughs> what you're going to ask me now is about the cosmos. Yes. What about geometry in the cosmos? <coughs> Professor, uh, going a bit broader, maybe uh, too broad, I don't know if there is a connection only. That's why we're here is to try to find out. How does this geometry affect the cosmos? Well, I think it's a good question, but you can reverse it immediately. How does the cosmos affect us through geometry, which is really what happens? What's fascinating is that we are obsessed at the moment. The modern scientific community are obsessed with accident and um, everything having come from a blind explosion. I mean, that's, it, it, they're, they're all metaphors for the state of mind of the whole community, sadly. What it amounts to is if you want to study the planetary bodies and the planetary orbits, if you want to study them to find out what beauty and order there is in them, then a completely different story comes about. And I had very fortunately had a very good student who came to work with me and did some research on the planetary orbits. And his findings were so remarkable, I mean virtually astounding. We got very excited because every single orbit and every single physical body and so forth, they all related to all the other bodies in, in, in absolute beautiful proportional order because he'd found a key to it and the key was the orbits um, are elliptical, we all know the orbits are elliptical in the physical plane but he said if you reduce those elliptical orbits to their archetype which is a pure circle without changing the distance then you've got what, what the, um, if you like, the transcendental or the archetypal uh, form before it got into the world of accidents, which we call them in this world we're in now. And so he, he reduced all the orbits to their um, uh, archetypes and suddenly everything just fitted together. And what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to try and draw this on the board, but I hope it'll carry across. This is the physical body of the planet Mercury, brought to its archetypal form. All planets are slightly squashed because they're in the accident in, in our world. This is the archetypal body, or if you like, the mean uh, physical body of planet Earth. This, this is, if I say Mercury, most people think, oh, we're just talking about that little pill flying around. Mercury is the messenger of the gods. There's no reason why. Okay, and this is Mother Earth they relate to each other precisely on a five-pointed star. They relate exactly by a golden mean. If you draw a five-pointed star inside the circle of Earth, it gives you exactly the size of, of Mercury. Therefore, the golden mean proportion, which is based on the five-pointed star, is the most important proportion in the whole of geometry. It's the only one where you need a single term to continue as small as you like and as large as you like. And what, it, what it, it's saying this discovery of a student of mine is that <coughs> the messenger of the gods is in a golden mean proportion to Earth. Now, that's pretty astounding to find the physical bodies, but the thing just blew all of us up, our minds. The sun is in the center of the solar system, so it's a little point in the middle of this, this diagram here. This first circle you see here is the actual orbit of Mercury around the sun. That's the orbit now. And this is the orbit of Mother Earth. And you put a five-pointed star between those two. Okay. Put a five-pointed star between those two, and you've got the orbit of Mercury and the orbit of Earth, not the physical bodies, but answering to the same geometry. And that is so remarkable, it doesn't touch anywhere near any contemporary astronomy theory. When he, and he found these for all the different bodies in the solar system. When we sent his findings to all the astronomy departments in UK, I didn't get a reply from any of the professors. Not that they wouldn't. What's interesting was, and I've had the same thing with my own books, when I did a book on stone circles, if, the, if you're undermining, as far as they're concerned, the way they look at a subject, then all they do is they ignore you. It's the best thing to just ignore you. They can't look at this, they can't question this, it's a mathematical truth, they can't 
they can't deny them. So nobody criticised this, but at the same time, nobody wanted to talk about it. And there was non-talkable non about it. <coughs> With a bit of luck now, I can try and do a drawing and hope I can get it to be accurate. <coughs> and I'm going to start... I'm going to start with this one. One thing was that this triangle here, Plato talks about as being the most important and most beautiful triangle of the universe. And what's interesting now is that um, in, in physics, modern contemporary physics, the idea of something having three qualities, the qualities of three, upness, downness, and spin, they, they talk about in quarks and so forth, that triangulation is, is very much in, in, in contemporary physics. But Plato said this particular triangle is the most beautiful one in the universe. He didn't say why, but it's very interesting. If that distance is one, from there to there is one, this distance is exactly two, and this distance between, I beg your pardon, this distance is one, this distance is two, this distance here cannot be explained in numbers. It goes on forever. A computer can exhaust all energy on planet trying to solve what that distance is. It's what's called the square root of three. I'll put it up here, and I won't because it's not big enough. But <coughs> in the Timaeus, we, we, we showed the whole numbers, but he then gave us the figures made out of solid. The square root of three, this is what we call it. Not many people even know where the word square root comes from. <laughs> it comes from the Arabs, and the root meant it was below the ground. You couldn't see it. Fascinating. So that is a symbol we use for a number which can't be expressed. In other words, if you put it into a computer and ask, what is the number which multiplied by itself will give us three, we'd think it very simple. It goes on forever. Literally. The computer will go on until it's dead. So there's, there's three absolute key numbers here. One is the square root of three, one is the square root of two, and one is the square root of five plus one over two. This one is known as the golden ratio this one here. That one is the diagonal of a square. That one. This one is half an equilateral triangle. This is half an equilateral triangle. If I draw this one side, then flip it over and draw it again, it will give you an equilateral triangle. So this, this distance is two, this distance is one, this here is a square, which is three. <coughs> so this can't be explained by a computer, this can't be explained by a computer, and neither can that. But they're a very important part of Plato, and it shows that Plato is dealing with a geometry which is transcendental. Anyway, what I want to do now, if I can, <coughs> is just to show you one of the constructions that my student came up with, which I think is really rather beautiful. I think we might be able to get it on here. Let's see if we can. I'm going to do a drawing, which is a very simple, straightforward, geometric drawing, and then it's going to turn into having cosmic significance, I hope. When you draw in a circle like that, <coughs> it's, and you need to know where the centre is, what you have to do is you have to come down and put the point onto the periphery of that circle you've just drawn. Do a little, little line there, and then come over to here, put the point into there, and cut that. And that gives you the center. Now, what I showed before, I can either choose to divide it this way or this way. Well, as I advocated the heaven-earth axis, I shall divide it that way. <coughs> now I've got the center. <coughs> as long as my line goes through the center, it will be an exact diameter, even if I don't hold, hold it up brilliantly. Now what I want to do is I want to put a square around this circle, which is both a symbolic act, and in this case it's going to become a cosmic one, I hope. And it does mean I've got to find this 
Now, when you have to find a right angle, um, you could be lazy. If you could just take this instrument and put it on there, get your right angle, or you can construct it. Now, I will always advocate to anybody they should construct it because that is what the art of geometry is about. Now, I'm not changing my radius at all. I'm going to put a little nick there and a little nick there. I'm going to come up here. Put a little nick there. And a little nick here. Now from those four, I have to come out into the field here. Do an arc there. And come out into the field here. And cross that. Do the same over here. All these moves that I'm making have symbolic meaning, but we haven't got time to go through all those at the moment. In the same way that drawing a circle, <coughs> drawing a circle on a horizontal line, you are reenacting the rising of the sun, the completion of the day, uh, not the completion, but the height of the day, and then the completion of the day, and then night. So now I can get a horizontal through here. If I'm reasonably careful, and I'm going, I can now construct a square. <coughs> I haven't changed. You'll notice I haven't changed my. I haven't changed this radius at all. I'm going to put my compass point on there, and I'm going to do. An arc like that, and an arc like that. And I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to put an arc like this. And already I'm showing a degree of inaccuracy because I'm in this lovely accidental world. I'm going to put my compass point in here. By the way, when you're using this, you really have to remember this hand is the responsibility of holding the godhead. This hand has to guide us into this world. Whenever you're putting your point down, you use your left hand if you're right-handed. You, you make sure you have your finger resting on the surface and you use these fingers to make sure the point goes where you want it to be. I want the point to go into here now and my left hand is making sure it goes in as accurately as I can. I then get a half circle there and I then again come here and I put a half circle in here. I've now got a square. And that square, if I join that point to this point, it'll go through here. So it'll give me an exact square on that. But we haven't quite got there yet. I'm not going to tell you what these orbits are until we get there. Now I'm going to put my compass point into this juncture there, onto that point of the square if you want to call it such. I hope my compass will close. I think what I might have to do is to go on to my other instrument because it can handle a smaller radius. Quite important to try and get your two points evenly, even height. I'm putting my compass point on here now, and I'm going to do a circle which exactly tangents the center blue one. I'm doing a little circle now which exactly tangents, exactly touches there. Now these four should be exactly the same. given that I put the point in the right place. Not as good as it should be, but we'll have excuses for living in an accidental world. Then we go up onto here, do the same thing. I'll get this right now. And 
do the same thing on here. I'm having to adjust a little bit because of my inaccurate drawing. Not the best conditions to do drawings on. Okay, we have these four and this. Now, what I'm going to reveal to you is, if I think it'll, yes it will. Now I'm going to go back to the middle again. And as long as I shall be excused the circumstances, which are part of my incompetence, um, I'm going to do a circle which just touches the outer points of these. Well, this is where my inaccuracy is quite, quite radical, so I shall bring it in twice. <laughs> Live with my incompetence. Get a little bit closer with this one. But if you do this drawing extremely carefully, which I have not really done as well as I should have done, we now find such a simple thing as being able to put a square around a circle, which is a symbol of squaring the circle. If I now tell you this, so the first circle we drew is the orbit of Jupiter. And by putting a square around that orbit, this is the mean orbit. Very important to remember that, the mean orbit of Jupiter. That's the center circle. If we then draw this drawing carefully and accurately, which mine is not, but it's good enough for you to see what's going on, by putting these little fellows in, getting that distance right on the square, we come to here. These should be points of exact tangent to these circles here. And this will now give us the orbit of Saturn. So that is known as the mean orbit of Saturn. Saturn, we draw like that. Now, what's interesting about this finding by my student was, and he did this for all the different orbits. In fact, you can create the whole of the solar system on an eight-fold symmetry, and I always think of the eight-fold symmetry as being hot. This, this orbital system, given they are the mean orbit, that is um, taking them from an ellipse to a perfect circle without changing the distance they've gone, it is an accuracy of 99.7 degrees, percent I should say. That by any um, mathematical standing is a fantastic high degree of taking a physical calculation. When I told um, dear Raj, he was very impressed <laughs> as a physicist. But what it means is that there is a simple geometry underlying the proportions of all the planetary system. And although we showed the one of the five point star of Mercury in the Earth, here are the two and remember, one needs to begin to think, whatever culture you're in, what, what does Saturn represent? What, is, what does Saturn as a god represent? What does Jupiter as a god represent? And here's a relationship between them, which is based on a fourfold increase proportion. But that shows that there's a, there's a very disarmingly simple geometry behind the whole of the whole solar system, whereas <coughs> It's not surprising when he sent his book down to the different departments in the UK that this kind of simplicity is quite threatening to people who want to have you for five years to say, until we've got you for five years, you can't have a qualification. And then during that five years, they have to brainwash them. Oh, I've got to be careful when I'm saying I've got to cut this out. <laughs> brainwash them into big bangs. <laughs> the whole thing's an accident. But in fact, it can be demonstrated. He published this little book called The Little Book of Coincidence. I'll have to get you a copy if you haven't got one either. <coughs> Showing all these things. And it, it's really quite staggering um, how everyone... In fact, um, he goes back on planning sacred buildings. Sacred buildings were planned with this knowledge because this knowledge was not released to the public. It, the sages had it and the sages shared it between themselves and the craftsmen. And there were, there were bonds of... Um, confidentiality, whatever you want to call them. I don't like the word secrecy too much. But those bonds were kept because, <clears throat> and I think Einstein himself said, that once a top scientist releases something as powerful as E equals mc squared, which is such a simple little triple equation, then an atom bomb can happen. 
you're releasing knowledge to people who really are not going to behave correctly with that knowledge. So you can imagine we also find ourselves worrying whether this should be released, it's so simple. But hopefully what it will do, it will help simplify the, the iron grip universities have on the mind. And um, whether you dye the mind a different colour or you dye the mind completely, one way or other we've got to actually get back to a simplicity and that simplicity can be found in sacred geometry. That's my belief anyway. Uh, I <clears throat> was blessed to meet a, a young man uh, who is considered to be one of the top ten quantum physicists in, mm -hmm. in the world today mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. works with an institute in California now with a Nobel uh, Prize winner, mm -hmm. quantum physicist. Uh, he came to uh, this ashram, which of course mm -hmm. is something once again being around the energy that is beyond the simple and gross world. Mm -hmm. And he experienced some sort of super consciousness mm. uh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. He is now with a group in Princeton and others mm -hmm. been trying to come up with the quantum physics formula mm -hmm. for that experience wow. <laughs> and timelessness yes, as yes. well being sure. a very mm -hmm. big part mm -hmm. obviously of, of that super consciousness yes, of course. because time is uh, uh, in a way, I guess, an illusion in, in, in sure. some circles. <laughs> so what, if anything, could you give to those physicists, those young men who are unfortunately <coughs> been completely uh, deflated by modern teaching, mm -hmm. and yet they have, on a personal basis, experienced something that is now leading them to take their science in mm -hmm. that direction. Mm -hmm. How can you, and it, because it seems just by watching what you've done now, shown mm -hmm. this is nothing more than the dynamics of a flower. This is the same Absolutely. geometry. Yeah, it's, it's as if there's one simple mm -hmm. formula mm -hmm. to all of it. Yeah. No matter exactly. how large the cosmos Absolutely. or how small a simple flower, yeah, how, how can these young men benefit? Where would you lead them? Where would you guide them? Where would you tell them to look besides the intuitive level, mm -hmm. which of course is the really the real source of it all? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, Isaac, that, that leads to the very fact as, as to where we are, because <clears throat> probably the most important thing is human values. And, and it sounds a strange thing to say, okay, these guys are intense about their mathematics and all these immensely complicated things. But what I do now with my, my students, I get them to, to be quiet for a minute. I think no lecture ever does that my part of life. So they're all a bit baffled. And I said, I'm going to make an invocation. This invocation came from Pythagoras as far as I know. It's very well known here as Satyam. Sundaram, and so forth. Um, I'm going to suggest that, that this will not offend anybody's faith, anybody's religion, but whatever we do, we should consider, is it true, is it good, and is it beautiful? Simultaneously. And I think that's the thing for these people to realize. It's got to be brought down to what is the value to not only oneself doing it, but the community. <clears throat> I mean, Einstein is a perfect model of what shouldn't happen. And that is that you release... Um, well, I mean, I had no idea it was going to happen, but he tried very hard to stop it happening. But one's got to consider, I think, very deeply, is it good, is it true, and is it beautiful? Simultaneously, you can't do one. What's happening, you see, in modern physics is they're struggling for the truth alone. But is that truth good? And is that truth beautiful? I think that, those are the questions. It may sound very strange to them initially, but those seem to me the key things, putting those three qualities together, true, good, and beautiful. After that, <coughs> you get to the universal human values that Baba teaches, which are incontrovertible. Again, the five of them go from three to five, good golden mean relationship, or nearly. <laughs> and then you, you know, have peace, love, and so forth. And I think that it's, it's only by making sure you've got a comprehensive and balanced view of what you're looking at. <clears throat> I mean, why does one want to go further and further into a micro, micro, micro level of physicality? Why not go into your relationship you have with your dearest loved one and make sure that's good and beautiful and true? I mean, it sounds 
weird. But I mean, a lot of these people say, oh, my private life's got nothing to do with my work. Well, up to a point it doesn't, but up to a point it really does. And if they really want to get at the truth, and the truth which is going to be valuable to other people, it's better that there's got these other dimensions. I mean, the Dalai Lama going to this conference about uh, nanophysics and whatever, um, he's a man who preaches compassion and kindness as being the first consideration. And in, in a way, <coughs> even the relationship between academics, kindness and compassion and understanding, instead of competition and head bashing, which is what, what it's all based on, plus the fact there's a very well-known saying, which I picked up from you yourself, and that is, don't seek acknowledgement, seek knowledge. Am I not right? <laughs> and it's, it, the biggest problem with the contemporary world is people are desperately seek, seeking acknowledgement. And they want to be the finder of this formula. They want to be the one. And, and they want to get the Nobel Prize and so forth. Once you pull all that aside, as a totally, it's nice, but it's totally meaningless compared to what good is the work you're doing, what value, what beauty is in that work you're doing. I mean, to me, it's still staggering that people really don't know about plants. I don't think a study has been done as to what's the different kind of leaf at the bottom of a tree, the middle of a tree, and the top of a tree. Can you imagine? It's not even that study been done. One man, brilliant man, who you heard of well, uh, Rudolf Steiner, who is beyond the pale. Most people won't even entertain the name. Oh, Rudolf Steiner, he's a complete nutter. Won't have anything to do with him. But he pointed out or develop what Goethe had noticed. If you take a common buttercup, which in England is a wonderful little yellow flower, you put under your chin to see whether you like butter, they say, you pick a leaf off that buttercup at the top, and it's like a fern, you pick a leaf off the bottom, and it's like a little solid round thing. And the leaves on a buttercup, within a very small space, go through a transformation of about four different types of leaf so you couldn't pick a leaf off that buttercup and identify it. And what interests me, nobody seems to have done that for all the other plants. I mean, that's... Anyway, I mean, I'm completely inadequate to do it. I'm going to just do what I can on this flower. <laughs> the more I read about it, the more I know I'm, I'm not qualified to do it. But at the same time, I'm determined that to, to try to... If anybody wants to read what I say, let us make life science. It's about life. And if the physicists want to make their study relevant, let it be about life and promoting life. And if you like consciousness as the vehicle of life. But otherwise, the more it just gets into mathematical equations, it falls to the ground like dust. I mean, how many people could understand it even? I don't know if that's any help. <laughs> that is a poor man's <laughs> observation. But I have been very shocked looking at flower books to find nearly all of them are flowers cut right, right through. And the same, I learned anatomy that way. It's very interesting that you mentioned uh, something that really wasn't uh, a quote from me, but a quote from my master, Sri Sachasai Baba, oh, yes. who said, do not seek uh, acknowledgement, seek knowledge. Right. And here I am in an ashram where there's tens of thousands of people looking at him mm. continuously. Mm -hmm. And I took that as a symbol that I should not look at him because, in fact, I am him. Mm -hmm. I am God. We're mm. all divine beings, mm -hmm. which I believe. Mm. So I tended to immediately go into meditation whenever his presence mm -hmm. was nearby. I've now been accused of being asleep the entire <laughs> time. <laughs> I, I've watched you. You went to sleep. I watched you. But isn't that almost mm. the the mm. bizarre, mm -hmm. uh, coincidental situation that we are in this Kali Yuga? Mm. Is that the truth lies within, and those that seek the truth are mm. considered to be asleep? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Well, it's quite a, this issue of sleep is quite a big one because um, in many ways, if we are in one quarter of what we could be in, we're asleep to the other three quarters, even if we what we call it ourselves to be awake. And that is, that is quite a tricky one. But I, I, I really have no answer to your physicist. So it's very kind of you to think I might have, but all I can think of is saying that put whatever you're doing into human context, both yourself and the collective. One thing I've gained immensely from my visits here is that collective enlightenment is more important than individual enlightenment, but you can also reverse it. You can also say individual enlightenment will help the collective. 
It, it's this business of people thinking, I've come here just for me, just for me to get enlightened. I don't think that's right. No, it? It's uh, you know coming from a Christian background and actually from uh, a long line of ministers, they always refer to something as congregational prayer. Uh -huh. And it seems to almost go back to this mathematics. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Jesus and many other masters says one or more are gathered in my name and are right. concentrating on this thing. Then there is this mm -hmm. multiplication mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. times over mm -hmm. of this consciousness mm -hmm. or super consciousness, mm -hmm. whatever it may be called. Sure. Sure. And it seems to bring everyone together as one, yeah, yeah. When they are, yeah. this congregational prayer is occurring, which yeah. is why, mm -hmm. you know, I was very much down on coming from the Christian right and a long mm -hmm. line of it, and mm -hmm. was very angry at some of the uh, dogmatic things that they had created. Mm -hmm. And uh, my master one day got very—it's uh, only acting—but uh, he got very down on me, and he said, "They're seeking the same God you yes, are." Yes, that's true. So mm -hmm. this congregational prayer seems to be again, another secret mm. to the mathematics, to the flowers, yeah, yeah, to the consciousness, yeah. to so. the geometry, to everything. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And I, I suddenly saw myself thinking about having drawn a circle. The definition of a circle is a series of continuous points. Well, each point, or each day in the 360 degrees, is an individual, but it only works because it's a circle. <laughs> I think the North American Indians have that too. They talk about the circle, don't they, as being the community. I'm going to have to take another swig of water. Yes.